Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana inna ka anta al-alim al-hakim. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana inna ka anta al-alim al-hakim. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana inna ka anta al-alim al-hakim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Inshallah we'll be continuing with the Sahaba series today. And uh, subhanAllah you don't realize how fast two days come by. Um, but last week we were speaking about the people closest and most beloved to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we've talked about the, the people within his household and we've talked about some of his wives. And, and so inshallah, we continue upon the same track and talk to those that were closest to him in his life. And today inshallah, we'll begin with the Sahaba with a very unique uh, attribute, his uh, specialty or what he's known for, something very unique is that this is the only Sahaba mentioned in the Quran by his name. And, uh, and, and so this is a very unique situation. Once again, the only Sahaba, but yeah, so, only Sahaba mentioned by his name, and this is Zayd ibn Haritha, radiallahu anhu. And a uh, very, very unique thing when you think of the Quran, you read the names, you know, what, oftentimes you see the trivia with like how many times is the Prophet's name in the Quran? Not many, right? You see, um, you know, the, he's named often as Ahmad or, or Muhammad comes very infrequently in the Quran as well, sallallahu alayhi wa And otherwise, you also don't find many other names. You see names like such as Pharaoh very often, right? Um, but as far as the Sahaba go, you don't find any. Um, and you don't find any other than this. And then we also have one, and we talked about this in the lecture of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Uh, he's mentioned in uh, the story of the cave, Cave Tho, when he's leaving Medina. So he's getting a pronoun, right? This is in reference to Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And it says that when they were in the cave, and he had said to his companion, meaning to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, La tahsan inna Allah do not be sad, do not be grieved at the fact that we're alone and we're abandoned, Allah is with us. And so Zayd radiallahu anhu, Zayd ibn Haratha has the unique honor of being in the Quran and Surah Ahzab when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and that's uh, you know part of a longer ayah in which it's you know narrating a story from the seerah that um, related to uh, Sayyidina Zayd. And so inshallah we'll be speaking about him today um, and some of the tales from his life. And so uh, Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haratha radiallahu anhu has a very unique story, one that uh, when you study the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it really articulates um, the, the, the beauty of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It articulates the fact that the, there were men who would have gone completely unnoticed in society, have, would have gone completely unnoticed in history, meaning their names would have been completely forgotten had it not been for the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam being in their life and being involved with them. Zayd, radiallahu anhu, who was, um, was an Arab man, and he was born of a tribe that was not unknowable by any account, but at the same time, he was, he was born from a tribe where his mother and father were from two different tribes. And the story goes that when he was a young boy, and this is not he's an infant or anything, he's a young boy, in other words, he's comprehensive, and he has uh, the ability to distinguish and remember people. Him, and, He's with his mother, and, there's, and the narrations tell us that when he was with his mother, they run into a tribe, there's a tribal dispute that happens. We've talked a lot about the different tribalism and how uh, important that was to understand in the context of um, the that era and so within the dispute there's there's some sort of battle and there's conflict and it ends up that Zaid as a young boy is taken into the slave market now we don't have enough time to go into the concept of slavery in islam and in high level overviews but slavery was very much a part of that society and and until recent centuries it was still a very much a part of society and even today we can say there's newer forms of slavery that we, we encounter right and even in our american history we study slavery and how um you know there's the after effects of it still linger um and so slavery again was a part of the part of the era part of the society at that time and zayd ibn Hazrat, who was taken as a young boy as a slave now his story is very unique now he he's he's not in Mecca or anything, this is further out, right? He's outside of Mecca and he's taken as a slave. And then in the slave market, you're often sold based on your physical attributes, characteristics, whatever it may be, whatever the person who wants to purchase needs you for. And so Hakim ibn Hizam, uh, Hizam was a man who was related to Khatija radiallahu anha. He was the nephew, meaning his father was the older brother of Khatija radiallahu anha. Now he is going to the market and looking to buy someone to help out in the house. He needs a khadim, right? And so he needs someone to help with the chores, to help with the errands that go along. And so he's looking for someone. And who does he purchase? Zayd ibn Haratha, radiallahu anhu. When he purchases him, there's different narrations as to he was going to purchase it for Khatija radiallahu anhu. There's, there's some people say that he had gifted him to Khatija radiallahu anhu. You know, the point being that he ends up within the 
uh, custody or the ownership of Sayyidina Khadija radiallahu anha. So now he is there and he's then given as a gift to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So again, to just maybe timeline everything, this is before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam had gotten wahi, meaning he does not know yet that he is a prophet. Obviously with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he, he always is a prophet. And so he has not yet received wahi, meaning the society himself has not acknowledged himself as a prophet. And so this is the time of his life where he's married to Sayyidina Khatija prior to that. And so he's given as a gift to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And this is how he's one of the unique figures within the Sahaba who enter the household, who enter the household of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And now again, it is important to understand what he was to the family. He was a servant, a khadim, right? A someone who was there to serve the family. And as you can imagine and only guess that how were khadims treated in that society, right? They were not treated with respect. They were treated very much as the title says, slave, right? In other words, they're people that you use for work and housework. They're given the necessities of life, so on and so forth. And so, in terms of age, Zayd uh, ibn Hathar radiallahu anhu, who was like they say 10 to 15, somewhere in that range, years younger than the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa and this was something that you know was important to know that he was in his development developmental years with the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa and he's within his developmental years, and he's a young boy, you know, growing up in the house of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa we don't have many narrations or many stories about what's happening in these years that he's there. Because again, this is prior to the Wahhab of Islam uh, coming down and the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu some received revelation. And so the story from the Sirah that uh, I was mentioning earlier, this very emotional and very touching story that you know highlights the character of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his family, of course, is that there's a tribe of ben- Benukal, there's a tribe of Benukal people from this certain tribe are performing Hajj. And again, we mentioned that there was a Hajj before Islam, which is people come to do the pilgrimage. Mecca was the center, the hub, and people would come there not just for commerce, but also to do the pilgrimage to their um, idols. And so there's a group performing Hajj there. And the group of Banu Kalb, they see Zaid, meaning now he's a teenager. They see a young man named Zaid, and they recognize him, meaning, again, he was abducted, he was taken when he was a young boy, and now he's growing into a teenager. They see him, and they're like, oh my God, he's alive. And they see him, and they realize that his father and his mother back home from this tribe have been yearning for him, have been, have been begging to understand or, or find out where he is or figure out if he's even alive, right? And so they find him, and they realize, like, oh my God, he's alive, but he's also a slave. In other words, he's under the custody and ownership of somebody else. So it's not like they could just pick him up and, and walk on their merry way. So this tribe then returns back to where they're from and they inform the parents and they say, listen, your son is alive, right? And, and the narrators say that the parents were so grieved that, you know, there's, there's just like narr- tales of like their, their grief of lo- losing their child, the tales of grief of losing their, their, their son. And so Haritha, meaning Zaid ibn Haritha, the father of Zaid, has now heard this and he's hearing, my son is alive. Right, my son, who's taken from me as a child, he's alive and he's well. I need to go and get him. In other words, he's going to Mecca and he's saying, "I need to go retrieve my son." He takes his brother with him. He goes to Mecca, and he arrives within the city of Mecca and he's asking around for this. He's asking around, and what all he knows about Zaid ibn Hathar radiAllahu anhu is that he is with someone who is the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. And so, for two seconds, let's pause here and think about it, that Abdul Muttalib, you know, we've talked about how he had many, many children, many, many wives, and many, many kids, right? And so somewhere between 20 to 30 plus, we don't really know the number of, of grandkids. Now, if somebody's coming and saying, where is the grandson of Abdul Muttalib? What does that mean? That means that he's acknowledging that that reference is to one person in particular, right? That one person has that uh, that identity of being the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. And it also shows that this tribe, the Banu Kalb, despite not being from Mecca itself, they acknowledge Abu, Abdul Muttalib as a legendary figure, right? He is a, he is a legendary figure within, within the era, within generation. And so just by saying who's a grandson, that shows that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was associated with that, meaning that lineage that we talk about, that Nasb is so important to understand, to know why the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was put into the family he was put into and why he has that lineage above him. And so he asks, where is this person? They say he's by the Kaaba. And so they go to the Kaaba, they see the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sitting there. And this is a custom of when people would ask something of you, what, you do, what do you do? When you need your mom or dad to give you something, or you need something from your siblings, what do you do? You, you butter them up a little bit, right? You're like, hey, how's it going? You know, whatever, whatever form of buttership, you know, you choose to, to, to implement at that point in time, you, you soften them up a little bit, right? Say nice things, compliment, praise, uh, all the above. And so they do the same thing. They say, oh, grandson of Abdul Muttalib, you of the generous tribe, you of the noble tribe, someone with the great lineage, you take care of the poor and you, you host people when they arrive to the city. In other words, he's buttering up the Prophet Muhammad because naturally he needs to ask him for something. 
And so Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu sitting there, he says, okay, yes, like how can I help you? In other words, he's getting the point. He's understanding that they're basically, come, they've come to ask for something. So how can I help you? He says, we ask you in your, you know, to be generous. You are from a generous family, be generous to us and give us our son back. Give us Zaid back, right? We've come all this way. We have not seen our son for years. He was taken from us. He was not a slave. He's from, he's not from, you know, he's not what, what he was sold as. He's not a slave. He's our son and, and we need him back. Please give him back to us. So then Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sitting, he's listening to him. And then they add saying that we brought all our wealth, meaning because they understand that obviously it's a slave, meaning it's an ownership. It wasn't society where you could just walk away with somebody. You need to bring payment, right? You need to bring payment to receive, receive your son. And so they say, we brought all our wealth. You could have all of our wealth. Just give us our son back. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looks at them, let's hear them out. And then he goes, okay, listen, how about this? Let's go and talk to Zaid. And if he recognizes you, he knows who you are, and, he, and you are his father as to who you say you are, then he can go with you. And I don't need your money. I mean, in other words, he's being, and, and this is a big deal, saying that you can have my khadim, take him back, that's your son, as long as he wants to go with you. In other words, get his permission, and then he can go. And then he said, however, if he doesn't want to go, and he wants to stay, I'm not one to force. Meaning it's not within our character, within our morals, or our mannerisms to force someone to leave if he's with us. And so you can only imagine his father's like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, I don't have to lose any money. I'm getting my son back. And he's giving me this option. So now they go to see Zaid, they go and, and find Zaid together. And so again, keep in mind that his father is standing right here during this next conversation, right? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first goes and asks, do you know these people, right? Do you know who these people are? He goes, yes, this is my father. In other words, they, he just confirmed that there is a connection. There is a relationship there. And Zaid, radiallahu anhu, has recognized his father. He goes, okay. And he goes, they've come to take you back, right? They've come to take you back. And then Zaid, radiallahu anhu, asks him immediately, what have you told them? What have you said to that? In other words, the exchange is important here because Zaid understands that if the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, I told them to take you back, he has to follow. In other words, that as his khadim, as someone under his custody, he would say, uh, under his uh, caretaking, he would say, you have to go back with him. And so he asked and he goes, what have you told them to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He says, I've told them the matter is up to you, right? If you wish to stay, I'm not going to force you to leave. If you wish to go, I'm not going to force you to stay. So Zaid radiallahu anhu, he says, if that's the case, and you're giving me this option of staying if I want to stay or going if I want to go, then let it be known, I will never choose someone over you, Ya Nabi. And at the time, again, he was, not, he, he, it's his owner, but he's saying, I would never choose someone over you, Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And so his father's standing there. And you can only imagine what a dad is going to say, a dad who traveled this far, a father who is literally his father, right? He's in disbelief. He goes, do you want to be a, like, son, are you choosing slavery over freedom? Are you choosing a stranger over your father? Right? Are you choosing someone who you don't know over someone who is literally your father? And Zayd radiallahu anhu, he says, based on what I've seen with him, based on how I've lived with him, based on my experiences with him, I can't choose anybody over him. There's no one better. Right? In other words, he's just saying his character as such. And I'm his, and he's a khadim, right? He is a, he is, he is a, he is a servant to him. And he says, I cannot be treated better. I, don't, I won't get it better anywhere else. Even coming with you, I can't choose anybody over him. Right. And so this moment, again, let's just, you know, to contextualize a little bit, the fact that he was bought as a slave. Right. He went through this hardship and now he's living with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and he's seeing his character that is so sublime, such a beautiful character that he's saying, I don't want to go back with my own father over this. I'd rather stay here. Right. And his father is obviously in disbelief. And you can only imagine what does a father go through when he sees something like this? He's hurt. Right. He's in disbelief and he's hurt. So what happens next? Prophet Muhammad وسلم, hearing this, he's, he's not only elated and happy because obviously he loves Zaid. He grabs his hand, he goes to the hijr. Think of the hijr like a pulpit, meaning like a, a place for announcements around the Kaaba. He picks his hand up, raises his hand, and he goes, let it be known that this person, that th 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 there's a concept that was called tabenni, which he, he does tabenni. He says, let it be known that Zaid is my son. Right? He's, he's proclaiming it. And so tabenni is an important concept, and not to go too deep into it, but at the time, we've talked about tribes and how when you're not a member of a tribe, you lose a lot of privilege. Right? And your privilege was not just based on you know, things similar today, such as wealth, but it was also based on your lineage. Right? The tribe you were associated with was, your, was, a, was a kabila that would protect you. Right? And so Zayd is obviously not from a kabila in Mecca. He's not, he's not a Qurayshi. And so the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is claiming him as his own son. Right? Full-blooded child type situation, not like an adoption without the name. He's doing a full adoption, meaning taking an ibn, tabenni. Right? And so this concept was very rare, but it also had its own privileges that came with it. A huge deal to do something like this, right? To proclaim somebody as your son. It's not a soft adoption. It's not a soft, you know, like gesture of kindness. This is a serious matter that you're actually saying this person is my son. 
And so this honor did a few different things. Again, his father's still there. And his father's seeing this. So now he's realizing my son is no longer a slave. Rather, he's his family, right? That, that this man named Muhammad وسلم, is making him his family. And that's the first point. The second point is he's announcing to the entirety of Mecca, saying that this person is my family. He's a part of my tribe now, right? In other words, you're not going to treat him how you want to treat him. You will treat him as he is a member of our tribe, right? Providing protection, providing that privilege that comes with it. And so this puts his father obviously at ease. And from this point in his life, he was referred to as Zayd ibn Muhammad. Sayyid ibn Muhammad, meaning the son of Muhammad. And so it's important to realize that this, uh, and, and many people may know later on, and we started the lecture saying Zayd ibn Haratha, so what exactly happens? And so it's important to know that this, this name of his was called for some period of time, right? Is that he was known as Zayd ibn Muhammad for some period of time. And eventually this was, the uh, Quranic ayat came down, right? Which, which say to call people by their fathers. And that ayah has, its, of course, its own wisdoms and its meanings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. But there's literally sahaba that say that we only knew him as the son of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning because he was referred to as Zayd Muhammad. So they, they grew up, like the children of the era grew up understanding that he was his son, right? And so, again, that tabani, that concept had such weight to it that people literally thought of him as his son. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands, and there's so many wisdoms that we don't have time to go into, right? him, call them by their father, who in the law. This is more just in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you don't call people by the names that you assign, but rather that they're biological fathers, right? That they're biological fathers. And if you don't know who their fathers are, if you don't know who their dads are, then they're your brothers in deen and people, friends or people that you associate with. And so that was the, that, that name change, again, had lasted for some time prior to it being changed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding him that you're not Zayn ibn Muhammad, you are Zayn ibn Haritha. And so then his name is then restored back. And so we have to also understand that the significance of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, we've talked about this a few times, not having any sons who survived him, right? None of his progeny were, were sons. And the importance of that being that he was the last messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously we know he had grandchildren, which we talked about, but yeah, again, he had no sons. And, and, and this also was a situation where his son was, uh, an adopted son was then said, nope, you are Ibn Haritha, right? But by all accounts, by the love, by the relationship, he was still that to the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so just one narration that um, I thought was very interesting to hear uh, was that Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, she has her, her opinion, she, she opines that if Zayd had survived past the life of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, then he would have been the one that would have been nominated as Khalifa. In other words, saying, and this is, this is Sayyidina Aisha saying this, and it's, it's an authentic narration saying that if the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, passed away prior to Zayd, then it would have been Zayd who people would have nominated as the Khalifa. In other words, saying that he actually was seen by those people in society as someone who's so close to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she's, of course, saying this, and her father's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, so it's not like she's saying this with any malcontent or any, any political intentions. This is a very much a factual staying for her. And so um, Zayd radiallahu anhu was married to Umm Amen as well as other women. And uh, to continue on with this year, in the closing minutes, he had a child who we, who inshallah, will cover one day, Osama ibn Zayd, who was someone very beloved to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Again, because of that closeness they had. And his Hibbu Rasulillah was the nickname given to this, this Sahabi, the love of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so his family, not just him, but his whole family was very beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone who, you know, participated in every single battle with the Prophet, battle of Badr, battle of Uhud. And we've mentioned in the past when we talked about Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, how, you know, men who, who strove, men who, who always were the first to sign up for battle, the first to fight with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were often told the, the, that they need to stay back for certain reasons. So we talked about Sayyidina Ali and how he had to stay back to take care of the family. So Zayd ibn Haratha radiallahu anhu was sometimes asked to do it as well. So the only battles that he was alive for that he did not participate was when he was assigned to protect the family. And that's a great honor in its own, of course, uh, despite the, the men themselves wanting to go into battle. And so in the closing minutes, inshallah, Zayd radiallahu anhu, he did not pass away a natural death. And he did pass away before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And he was martyred. And it was a very uh, vicious battle in which he was martyred. It's a part of the seerah, the battle of Muta'a. And this battle itself was the first battle with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the only battle with him against the Romans. And this is the only battle we have in the seerah itself, in the life of the Prophet, it was against the Romans. And it was a very fierce battle, a very bloody battle. And Zayd radiallahu anhu was given the honor, as we talked about, as the standard bearer. And so again, just to recap really quick, the standard bearer is the person who within the battle holds the flag. 
And this was, you know, the person who represented the army, the person who gave life to the army, right? Your flag bearer was a person of great honor. It was a, it was a station of great honor. Not everyone was just handed the flag. And it, it, so much so that there's succession, meaning if this person was to pass away holding the flag, then who's next? And if that person passed away, then who's next? And this line would go so far down, right? And then eventually it would be, and whoever is able to, meaning they, they listed out who should be holding the flag. So Zayd ibn Haratha radiallahu anhu is, is given the, the standard. And therefore you can imagine when you're going into a battle and you're holding the flag, who is the most noticeable person on the battlefield? The person who holds the flag. So he was one of the first casualties because that flag, of course, among the honor also makes you a prime target. And so this battle on, on a side note in parallel, we'll have two stories in that he's martyred in this battle, right? And then the flag is then given to Jafar and he also is martyred. And so the, the flag, you know, again, that situation is happening in this battle far from there. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is not a part of this battle. He's, he's back home in Medina. And we have a beautiful and a very profound uh, account and a narrative from the Sirah where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is sitting with his companions in Medina, the, those who did not go to the battle. Sayyidina Anas, Sayyidina Aisha is around. And he is narrating this entire battle live as if he is seeing it. Meaning he is literally giving a play-by-play -play definition and, and walkthrough of what's happening in the battle as they're sitting so, so far away, right? Thousands of miles away. And they're literally narrating, he's narrating this battle to the companions. And so the, the proof of this is that the companions had understood and, and were there present prior to anyone coming back from the battle. Meaning, you know, right now we have cell phones and, and things like that. But imagine if something was to happen far away, the only way for you to know it actually happened was for a message to come or a rider to come through and to give you the message. And he's narrating this. And he even says, Qutila Zayda. He says that Zayd has been killed. And then he says, and then he knows that Jafar has been killed. And when he says this, he, tears start to flow, right? And he begins to cry. And so within the seerah, again, it's important to know that the, we have many narrations of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, crying and his wife saw, right, in the, in, the, in the privacy of his home. We have narrations where, you know, we, we, we see, you know, Sayyidina Aisha sees him crying or one or two companions may have seen him crying in a moment, you know, he's in prayer and they notice him praying. But those are private moments. These are not public settings, right? This was a public setting. Right? In a public setting, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is sobbing. And we have very few accounts of him crying in a public manner such as this. Right? In other words, this is such a deep loss for him, losing Zayd, anhu, who was such a deep and, and painful loss for him that he had lost him and he's crying. And even the next day when the families had returned, he went to the household of Zayd right? to, to, for condolence. He would go and visit the house, but he went there first. Right? He lost Jafar as well, someone very close to him, but he went there first. And when he had made dua, inshallah, we'll close with this, is what he made dua, he made dua for Zayd thrice. May Allah forgive Zayd, may Allah forgive Zayd, may Allah forgive Zayd. Then they made dua for Jafar, and then Abdullah ibn Rawah, who was the third companion, who was the flag bearer. And so this is a martyrdom of Zayd radiallahu anhu. And in closing, just once again, to recap how this was a companion who, unless he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written for him to enter the house of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he would have gone into society unknown. Right? This, this military commander, this person who was in, in many ways, dem he demonstrated not only many principles of fiqh, and there's a story in the seerah with, his, with his, uh, one of his wives, Zayd bin Zainab bin, bin, bin Jash, and that story itself teaches us so many principles of usul and, and, and so many laws as well. His life in many different capacities was uh, uh, an important part of the seerah. And again, all of this was, again, the blessing of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those uh, in, of the characters of the Sahaba and to allow us to emulate them and to follow their path and, of course, to follow the path of our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Zakhla khair, inshallah, we'll be uh, back next week. Assalamu alaikum.